So I, I'm going to talk about uh, structure. I'm going to talk about uh, various other narrative concepts. And, and basically, the, the reason for this is adapting to change, um, new platforms, new stories, and, and also really trying to engage audiences in a much more competitive environment than journalists have ever really been used to. You know, we're, we're having to become better storytellers because there's so many other stories that people could be hearing about out there, including many false ones. And that's one of the um, reasons that I think that this area is particularly interesting. Um, and then hopefully by the end, I will come up against some of the problems as well that, um, that storytelling brings up and, and why we shouldn't pretend we're not storytellers. So there's a bit of foreshadowing there. Um, but before I go into the, the detail of things, I, I want to start, as I said, at the beginning where this all began. And, uh, and it started with Snapchat. Um, this was kind of what got me interested in narrative techniques to the extent that, um, uh, that, that I basically created a whole module at uh, Birmingham City University for master's students uh, on the two courses that were mentioned. Um, and, and the reason for this was, this was about September 2016. Um, Snapchat had been around for a while, but was uh, starting being uh, adopted by news organizations and journalists um, as a new way of telling stories, particularly for new audiences, for younger audiences who perhaps weren't engaging with traditional platforms that, that news organizations were otherwise publishing news on. And uh, I wanted to get to grips with Snapchat. It certainly wasn't the first or second or third time that I had a new platform to get to grips with. I'd been through this process before with Twitter, with Facebook, with um, even things like, um, I think it was Yik, Yik Yak. I'm trying to remember what it was called. I, I remember uh, that's one that kind of came and went and there are a few that have come and gone. And as I was going through this process once again, I realized that I was drawing on a lot of uh, techniques that I'd learned as a media student, actually. So I studied media at, uh, at undergraduate level. And so I learned about audio production and video production and journalism, of course, um, photography, composition. And I realized I was drawing on all these different skills from different fields and also some historical um, uh, stuff as well. So, for example, very early cinema wasn't necessarily horizontal. There was some vertical filming in the 19th century. Um, the whole horizontal structure that we're used to with cinema and, and later TV only became established as a convention after some early experimentation. There's nothing that says video has to be horizontal or even square. So I found myself drawing on all of this and I realized I've been here before, I've, I, I keep going through this process and I'm teaching a, a new platform now, but in the future, you know, my students are gonna have to learn other platforms. They're gonna have to go through this process of adaptation. I can't just keep adding more classes about how to write for Facebook, how to do Snapchat, how to do something else. Um, there needs to be some future proofing here. So I wrote, a book I wrote uh, the ebook Snapchat for journalists, um, which uh, talked about some of the principles, things like composition, the rule of thirds. You know that applies on Snapchat. It's a it's a rule from photography that's been applied in cinema and TV. Things like the importance of clear audio, which is something that video producers and audio producers learn. The importance of sequence. Um, all these principles that I was drawing on in this book were coming from other media, but also it was about learning the language of a new genre that was being invented in front of us. Um, now, obviously, as I've kind of touched on before then, if we kind of go back in time, journalists only really worked in, in one medium. We would, we would work in print as, as newspaper journalists. We might work as, as broadcast journalists. And, you know, our craft would be around words or around sounds or vision. Um, we would only have a limited number of formats to get to grips with. In, in, you know, when I learned 
journalism, I learnt how to write a news story in the inverted pyramid structure, and I wrote how to do features, um, mainly interview features, and that was really, you know, the scope of the of the kind of formats that I would learn. It, it, later on in a journalist career, they might become more of a feature writer, and they might venture into kind of different types of features. But even then, it was relatively limited. Of course, what's happened in the last 10 or 20 years is this proliferation of platforms. Um, so we're having to get to grips with all of those. We're no longer, you know, primarily or only, I should say, working in one medium. We're having to work in multiple media. And even within a single platform, there might be multiple um, types of ways of telling stories. So just on Instagram, you could do a photo story, you could do a carousel, you could do a reel, you could do a story, um, a, a kind of a swipe to advance story. So uh, you could do live streaming as well. So there's a lot there to get to grips with. We're having to constantly adapt. And as I said, my kind of, um, the, the problem I was trying to solve was in two or three or five or 10 years, the people that I was teaching about multi-platform journalism would have another platform to adapt to. I couldn't teach them what was going to happen in the future. Now, there's lots of uh, research, obviously, on, on these new platforms, and there's some interesting uh, stuff about the fact that these new genres are not only being I kind of created by media professionals, but actually users are taking a dominant role in creating and popularizing those genres. So if you look at video on YouTube, for example, the language of video storytelling on YouTube has developed in a way that's really kind of independent of TV stations or uh, film companies. You know, we've got a, a very different aesthetic, people talking direct to the camera, the frame is, is much tighter, the lighting, is quite an important component of YouTube videos. We've got um, things like unboxing videos, so things that didn't really exist before. And those have been invented by the users themselves. You know, TikTok at the moment is a, is a classic example of this kind of invention of ways of telling stories that we as professional storytellers have to be aware of and follow and and pick up and kind of use in our own ways. And this is a video from the BBC, which is a good example of how these challenges are being approached in the industry. Um, and you'll notice again, this is about dealing with um, audiences that maybe aren't engaging with journalism through, um, I say, traditional ways, you know, the old ways that, that people would engage with news. So I'm gonna play you a little clip from uh, BBC's research and development team. News used to be written to fit printed pages. Now, digital's taken over, but we're still writing articles the same way. Could there be something else? Enter eight weeks, 12 prototypes, and 26 users under 26. The young people we spoke to told us they want to understand complex stories, skim, then dig deeper if interested, get all the important information in one place, get different perspectives and form their own opinions, and have a choice of media. Not a lot then. Right. Let's see what we came up with. We created 12 new ways of telling news stories on smartphones. We tested them with people, then made them better. And here's the four prototypes they like best. Expander. Young people say BBC News often assumes lots of knowledge and that coming to stories halfway through can make it hard to understand. Expander lets you dig deeper at the points you might need more context. Simply tap to reveal extra information, a dictionary definition or video. There was lots of positive feedback on the modular style and having all the information in one place. 
So that's um, just one example of how one organization is, is trying to, in this case, actually invent new formats on top of all the ones that already exist and, and partly in response to new uh, ways of consuming news. So here we are then looking at these challenges. And uh, I'm, as I said, I'm going to kind of cover a, a few different aspects of, of narrative techniques of storytelling. And the first technique is about actually um, learning about the rules of the type of story that you want to tell. So this is really about reading a story in order that you can write one. Um, one of the most obvious it sounds really obvious, but I'm amazed at how many people don't do this. One of the most obvious ways to become a very good journalist is to read lots of journalism. And um, I, I see so many people who cannot write a news story because they basically don't read news stories or they can't do a decent Snapchat video because they haven't watched Snapchat videos. So how do you actually do that? Um, well, one of the key things is to look at what um, one academic out in Nouveau calls the instruments in an orchestra, uh, the instruments of an orchestra of genre. So being able to look at the ingredients in a story that tell you about um, the, the kind of rules of the game, the rules of storytelling in that particular format, whether it's um, an Instagram uh, carousel or whether it's a TikTok video or a YouTube, explainer or whatever it is so the first one is genre um, and that's fundamentally what we're what we're looking at in this first part different genres of storytelling the unboxing that i told you about earlier is a genre a genre of youtube video we've got um what's called mimesis and diegesis these are really fancy words for basically showing and telling so how much are you showing in your story how much are you telling there's the um, role of actors in your story and the role of the narrator in a story. There's a lot you can look at around temporality. So this is the use of time in storytelling. How do they use pacing compared to the duration of events in that story? How do they use, a couple of more fancy words here, prolepsis and analepsis? These basically mean flashbacks and flash forwards, so when you look ahead in the story. And then there's the structure. We're gonna spend uh, pretty much the second half of this, uh, this afternoon looking at structuring stories, what's called the fabula. These are all great pieces of jargon um, that, that really can be uh, really referred to much simpler things. So the fabula is all the elements that a story might include. So we've got showing versus telling, we've got flash forward and flashback, and we've got the elements of the story. And I'm going to go through each of these and kind of talk about how um, you can look for these when you're reading or watching or listening to stories in order to help you create stories in that particular genre on that platform in that format. So the first thing, the first on that list is genre. Um, genre is really important to be aware of. It's about a number of things. The most important one for us is about expectations. It's about a, an unspoken agreement between you as the journalist or the storyteller and your audience. Um, if you go into a horror movie, you don't expect to be laughing for two hours and feel completely relaxed. Um, you don't expect to, to see romance and um, things like that. You walk into that cinema with particular expectations. Horror genre is a very obvious and classic example of genre. But likewise, when you read a new story, you don't expect the author to suddenly be telling you their opinion. That's not what a new story promises. That's not the unspoken agreement. Um, and likewise, if you're watching a, a video on social media, you'll have certain expectations for example, you might expect that it has captions because you're likely to have the sound turned off. That's a, a quite a common convention now in social media video. So you need to kind of identify what is the genre that you are reading and that you are planning to create yourself. And 
we've seen a proliferation of genres over the last decade. Listicles are a very good example. Listicles are not a new thing. Um, there were uh, listicles in magazines long before the internet was invented, but they've certainly proliferated and been popularized and most importantly, um, reinvented new rules have emerged. Um, so I'll ask you in, in the thread, if, if you were going to look at a listicle today, if you imagine a listicle in your mind, what features would you expect to see in a listicle? Or indeed you can shout out. So what is essentially what is generic about a listicle? What makes you look at something and think that's a listicle? Numbers is a classic example. Yeah, numbers, it's so obvious, everyone's hesitating to say it, but we're expecting to see a number of headings with numbers on them. Short and snappy, that's definitely an expectation of a listicle. That's the promise of a listicle. What the listicle promises is you're going to find out about something in a quick and easy to digest way. Humor is, is definitely something that we see in a lot of listicles. Um, what about something other than the actual words? There's something I see in a lot of listicles. Yes, yeah, so or thematic, often they are thematic. So Fred's got it there, icons or images. Um, it's quite common for, an, for a listicle to have an image for every item in that list. Sometimes a GIF as well. GIFs are particularly often used or memes are often used in listicles. Um, and we'll touch a little bit on memes uh, later on. Uh, ratings is, is an interesting point, actually. I think ratings, it, it, the kind of top fives, those are, that's kind of what we used to have um, that's one of the, the, the genres from magazines that that um, that listicles have emerged from. So that's a, a good demonstration of just how you know a genre like a listicle already creates expectations in you as soon as you hear that word. Live blogs are another genre that's emerged over the last decade, and and certain conventions have become established in live blogs over the year, uh, over the years. For example, it's now common to have a summary at the top, a bullet point summary at the top of a live blog. That's that's come across over the years. Twitter threads, um, also numbered. We often see the thread emoji now. That's become a convention in Twitter threads. Um, horizontal stories where you swipe to advance, that's a relatively recent genre. Memes, um, certain uses of fonts, things like that. Explainers are another recent, um, recently popularized genre. What I would call ergodic stories, these are stories where you choose your own adventure. So you, um, you, you make a choice and that dictates the next step in the, in the story. So this, for example, is a meme. Um, now, uh, memes also have kind of evolved and, and some of the conventions that have been established are now being reinvented. But one quite common um, quality of a meme is the fact that we often see this font, which is impact. It's normally white with a black outline. And there's normally a top bit and a bottom bit. So there's kind of a first piece of text above the image and a second piece of text at the bottom of the image. These are, oops, conventions of the genre of the meme. Um, here's another one. Also, memes tend to obviously use images that have, um, that, that, that lend themselves to reuse and use and reuse and kind of, uh, being used over and over again to tell lots of different stories. This is probably my fav favorite example of, of what I would call meme journalism. I'm, I'm always on the lookout for examples of meme journalism, people using memes as a way of, of reporting on current events. So on the left, you can see the, the, the story, which was about the, the, the um, staging of the fake murder of a journalist in order to um, 
it was kind of like a sting operation and the wife uh, of the of the person whose death was staged didn't know about this she genuinely believed that her husband had been had been killed had been murdered um and jane bradley who's a journalist fantastic journalist um created this meme using the distracted boyfriend image which you uh, I've almost certainly seen, I'd be interested in how many people haven't seen the distracted boyfriend image. But, um, and she sums up the kind of, the, the, if you like, the human heart of this story or the emotional reaction to this, which is, my God, you know, this, this guy um, has kind of essentially prioritised the special forces operation over the emotions of his wife and six kids, not one, not two, but six kids. And it's a, it's a really succinct visual way, visual storytelling form, uh, way of telling this story. So memes have this, have this convention. And you'll notice, again, this is in impact font, white with a black outline. So we can, we, you can kind of look at a meme and think, OK, there are certain things that seem to recur here, um, certain images, certain fonts, certain colors and, and patterns. Um, with, even within this particular, if you like, um, uh, collection of stories, so the distracted boyfriend meme is a whole subgenre of stories that's told in a certain way. So if I want to use this image to tell a story, I need to look at lots of examples to get used to how it's used to tell stories. You know, where's the beginning, middle and the end? And there's more genres, podcasts, uh, you know, have, have emerged as a genre and developed over time, including subgenres, long form stories we'll talk about later. So these are longer than usual stories. Scrolly telling uh, we'll also talk about. I've mentioned unboxing videos, walkthroughs are another example of a, of a genre that's essentially become invented uh, on YouTube and live streams generally, again, I would argue that Twitch has, has kind of emerged as a platform for a particular type of live stream. And then Twitch itself has kind of expanded and proliferated into other genres as well. So these are all lots of examples of genres that I might as a journalist want or need to adapt to. So I need to look at what the rules are on those platforms. And in particular, I need to pay attention to the distinction between amateur production on those platforms and professional production. So what does a professional storyteller, professional podcaster do that's good, that makes it professional? I'll, um, I mentioned scrolly telling. I'd, I'd be interested, let me know in the, in the chat how many of you are familiar with the term scrolly telling and how many of you are not familiar with the term scrolly telling. But I will show you while you're doing that uh, an example of the seminal example of scrolly telling, which is the snowfall um, story by the, the New York Times. So I'm just going to stop my share and change it to, um, in fact, no, I'm not gonna go. To this one. This is if I can actually come out of my presentation. Here we go. Right, so I'm going to go back to the top. So this is Snowfall. This was published by the New York Times in, I want to say, 2012. Um, and um, it's worth pointing out that before this story was published, a lot of the elements that you're about to see were not common at all. Now, in a sense, the New York Times kind of helped to invent a genre here, the genre of scrolly telling. And we can see a number of features as we go through. Um, again, in the chat, see if you can kind of spot things that, that you think, even if you don't call this scrolly telling, I want you to kind of 
virtually shout out uh, examples of features of this story that you've seen time and time again in other stories as well. So this is a this is a, a piece of long form journalism as well. This is a very long story. It's about an avalanche and and what happened during this avalanche. And the first thing to point out is that this story takes up the whole of the screen. We've no adverts, we've no uh, page junk distracting us from this story. The other thing is we've got this looping piece of video or GIF, it could be either. This is the, probably the first um, generic element here of a scrolly telling story, the kind of looping video clip. Now, as I scroll down this story, something interesting happens. I'm going to go back and forward so you can see this transition. What happens here is the, the image and the text do not move as I scroll down. But another part of the page, the first paragraph and this kind of white background, scrolls up over the top of it. This is what's called uh, parallax scrolling. So it's where you have two different elements on the screen that are moving at different speeds and it creates an illusion of depth. If you've ever played a, a kind of an arcade game where you're flying a, a, spa you know, a spacecraft or something like that across the screen and the background is moving at a different speed, that's where parallax comes from. It's, it creates that illusion of foreground and background. So you might have a foreground of houses, which is moving quite slowly and uh, sorry, quite quickly. And the background of hills is moving quite slowly. And that technique is used in, in scrolly telling where you have this essentially is the background. And as you scroll up, the foreground comes up over the top of it. And also you've got a fade as well, a transition. And this continues as we go through the story, different elements come in and fade in and become color. Um, we've got fade outs again. Uh, as I go through, we'll see this video starts playing. So we've got this auto play. There are elements that I can play as I go through. And there's a particularly spectacular point. I'll carry on, see if I get to it. Um, now I'm scrolling now, I should point out. So again, we've got uh, an animation. And I'll go to the second page and see if I can get to the, the spectacular bit. There we go. We've got some in, um, some kind of explanatory video. And essentially, the scrolling action triggers pieces of animation, transitions, things like that as you go through. I think this is the piece I was looking for. So this is kind of like a fly through of a 3D environment. Now, after this story was created, um, the first thing to point out is that it was extremely, extremely successful. It had something like 7 million views in the space of a week or two. It was um, one of the most successful stories they'd ever done. Massive engagement time, people spending a long time on this story. And um, that's a really key piece of information because that's um, one of the key drivers that, that led other organizations to want to replicate this format. And it also led software companies to create platforms that would make it easy for you to create your own scrolly telling story. So we had a number of these created and, and um, it is now easier to create these sorts of stories. There are JavaScript libraries that, um, that allow you to do it. Uh, uh, Flourish has some visualization tools that allow you to create similar effects. So that kind of, if you like, established some of these conventions, things like parallax, uh, movement, fade-ins, um, uh, looping video, things like that, those became part of the markers of that genre. So I'm gonna stop that share and switch 
back. Let me get my uh, presentation going again. And let me just stop that. Oops. There we go. Okay, so that's that, that's an example of one of the new genres, and also a little bit of, uh, of an example of how a genre gets popularized and and um, it becomes generic. When that first started, it wasn't a genre; it was a one-off. It was it was um, attention grabbing. It's now become generic. Now, another thing to look for in in genres in a particular type of story that you want to tell is how um, the the narrator plays a role in those stories. There are three options here, basically. You can have what's called an effaced narrator. This is a narrator that is invisible as far as the audience is concerned. You can have um, the third person narrator and you can have a first person narrator. So the first person narrator is where the, the writer of the story, um, you, has a voice in the story. You, you write the word I. I spoke to this person. I did this. Um, Dana life stories obviously have to have a first person narrator. In broadcast journalism, you often have first person narration because the journalist is in front of you on the screen uh, and you know they can't pretend that they're not there. So that's where you get broadcast journalists saying things like I spoke to this person or I did this. But you don't get that in print journalism and online journalism because the journalist tries to hide effectively. You have the effaced narrator. So in written journalism, when you look at written journalism, look at how the narrator doesn't ever intrude on the story. There's never really in news reporting a mention of I. In fact, this is um, such a challenge in some situations that there's a middle way, a solution to the problem of where the journalist has played some sort of role in this story and they don't want to use the word I. And that is where the third person comes into it. So in this situation, um, let's say, for example, the journalist has been given some exclusive material or has uh, made a freedom of information request, and that's an important part of the story. Um, then they won't say I made an FOI request or they won't say I was told by this person exclusively because they don't want to say I because that's not the convention of the genre. Instead, they will use this third person. And that would normally be something like the BBC understands. Yeah. Or the Guardian has obtained exclusive information. Yeah. An FOI request by the Daily Mail has found that. So we're talking as a brand, we're talking in the third person. It might even sometimes be the word we, but it will never be the word I. And it makes it more professionalism. It makes it um, fit within the expectations of the audience. Then there's temporality, the use of time. So uh, moving forward, moving back, um, slow motion is an example of temporality and hyperlapse so kind of uh, speeded up motion is another example of temporality. Now, those are obvious examples of temporality in video and film, but you can think of the same sorts of ideas in written storytelling as well. You can speed up the sequence of events and you can slow down the sequence of events. So you can spend 800 words talking about something that took a second. Uh, equally, you can take you can spend 800 words talking about something that took 800 years. This is what's called uh, pacing, and it's about the difference between the duration of events and how long you take to tell the story. I don't know how many of you uh, watched the final season of Game of Thrones. How many of you have watched Game of Thrones? It was the reaction to that final season was a really interesting example of the importance of pacing in storytelling. People weren't very happy with the final season of Game of Thrones. 
But what was most interesting about it is that they, it wasn't that they weren't happy with the actual events, the actual sequence of events in the story. What they were unhappy with was the, the pace at which it happened, the pace at which, for example, particular um, characters changed. Um, it was very fast. It, 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 it felt rushed was, if you like, the most common complaint. And actually, that's quite a common complaint in the final season of it, it's really interesting. You know, actually, in TV, it's not very often that we see the ending. You know, most seasons go on and go on and go on and then get cancelled without a chance to end. Um, so, it's, so it's not many where you, you get a chance to uh, the writers have to plan for an ending. And in some ways, I think writers have much less experience of doing that. And that's why you get these rushed uh, endings. Um, so pacing is, is something to look out for. When you listen to a podcast, for example, how long did the events take that they're telling a story about? And how much time do they take to tell that story? If it feels slow, then maybe they should have spent less time on those events. If it feels rushed, maybe they should have spent more. But also, it, it tells you something about the genre and what's typical in terms of the difference between duration and pacing. Um, another thing to look for is present and past tense. Is, is um, Are things written in the present tense or in the past tense? One thing that I, I, I uh, always point out to people for whom English isn't a first language, and indeed for those for whom English is a first language, look at the difference between tense in headlines of stories and the actual stories themselves. It's a really odd quirk of English journalism or uh, English language journalism. Headlines are often written in the present tense, you know, man bites dog. Uh, and the, the actual story is written in the past tense. Um, a dog has been bitten by a man, or a, a man has bitten a dog. Um, and, and that's a kind of a weird tension. It's, it's quite, a, quite an interesting thing once, once you know to look for it. And so that's something to look for in storytelling. News in its headline uses present, uh, present tense. Um, in feature writing, you might get present tense in a feature, but you wouldn't get present tense in a news story most of the time unless something is ongoing. So look for that to help you adapt to that, um, uh, to that genre. Then there's flash forward and flashback, prolepsis and analepsis. Um, the opening scene of American Beauty is a famous example of, of um, uh, flash forward where he talks about what's going to happen in less than a year I'll be dead that's what he says in the opening scene of American Beauty so there's a flash forward it's flash forwards are much less often used than flashback um, in a news story you you do get a flashback you start with the most current event or the most recent event um, so someone has said something and then there'll be a moment at which it kind of flashes back to the background to this new thing. So party leader Jeremy Corbyn first suggested this policy during his leadership election campaign. So we flash back to 2015 after about four paragraphs in a news story. So again, look at how they use that movement in time. Does it flash back in time or is it chronological? Does it start at the beginning and go to the end? Very few stories actually do. A live blog is one of the exceptions. Feature stories sometimes start at the beginning. News stories never do. They always start very, very recently and then go back once they've told you what's new. Um, Snapchat stories uh, and Instagram stories are another example of a chronological story. You don't generally get flash back and flash forward in the story format, the, the Instagram story, the Snapchat story format. And there's a clear technological reason for this, which is that the way that these stories are recorded, 
it makes it quite difficult unless you really plan ahead and you can but generally you're, you're recording in the sequence that, that that your story is going to take place um so um that does mean a bit of planning you, you're not going to be able to cut back and forward so if you're going to tell a, a snapchat or instagram story or even a TikTok, um think about the, the structure of that story in advance and make sure that you capture it in that order because you're not going to be able to rearrange elements in the way that you can in other media a great quote uh, in the in the comments there in the chat there um, from fred about flashbacks from american journalist john franklin that they are powerful but you typically only get one shot per story so i need to choose wisely i think that's a really good point about flashbacks you, you can't use them very often um, and then probably one of the most important narrative concepts to be aware of, um, even if you forget the words themselves, mimesis and diegesis, it's the, the advice to show, don't tell. So um, inevitably, in, particularly in journalism, there's a lot that you will have to tell that you cannot show. But um, were possible, you should always choose to show something rather than tell it. And this is this example that I have here is, is one of my favorite examples. Um, it's a, a court report from a, a case um, to do with a, a couple of teenagers who'd committed um, quite a, a, an awful crime that had captured the attention of, um, of journalists and, and indeed audiences. Now, remember the conventions of the genre here. This is news. So the reporter cannot intervene, cannot talk about I. They certainly can't talk about what they think. It's not important to the audience what the journalist thinks here. Um, and what she's doing here is describing, she's showing us what happens. And there's a, there's a wonderful moment. It's, it sends a shiver down my spine, um, even now reading it, where she talks about uh, the, the reactions to the verdicts and the, there's two girls, a younger girl and an older girl, and it says how the younger girl's family waited by these windows. Um, nobody was watching or waiting for the older girl. That sentence stands on its own. There's no judgment made by the journalist. There's no interpretation. There's no opinion. And there doesn't have to be. You don't need to tell us what you think. You don't need to tell us what this means. We're perfectly capable of working it out ourselves and letting it stand on its own like that is so much more powerful. As I said, it sends shivers up my spine, even now. And if I was reading this and there was another sentence or, or instead of this sentence, the journalist was saying something about, um, it seems like no one cares about this older girl. She didn't have any, she didn't appear to have any support. That doesn't have nowhere near the same impact as simply just showing us this girl on her own, having been convicted of a crime and sentenced, while the other girl that's been convicted is surrounded by her family um, and, and has a very different experience. So showing is, is generally much more powerful. Um, now, I found a good quote on, on the use of showing and telling in uh, interviews from a, a piece of research, which I think makes a really good point about interviews because I see a lot of interviews where people make the mistake of thinking an interview is a, tr is a transcription of what was said. So they will interview someone, they'll ask them some questions, they'll write down the answers. And then as a piece of journalism, they will publish, here's a question, here's the answer. In its worst format, it's literally question, answer, question, answer. Um, now that's very quick, but it's not very interesting to read. And the mistake that's being made is to think that an interview is literally what was said. It's not. It's a story. And as a result, when you take that raw material from your interview, you need to be thinking about what is the best order to put it in it's very unlikely that your first question would be the first question in your in, in your actual story because your first question in an interview is designed to put your interviewee at ease 
it's generally quite broad it's generally not very interesting you're not going to open your interview with the most challenging um, exciting question that you've got because you want to relax your interviewee first if you're a good interviewer but your actual published interview will start with something that's going to grab the audience and hook them in so an interview um, suggests a mimetic representation of a conversation in other words it it makes it look like you're showing what happened and it makes it look like it's the chronology of what happened in other words i asked this question and then that uh, that question was asked um but really that's a sleight of hand it's a trick in a lot of interviews most interviews it's not in chronological order um we work with the pacing of the story we speed things up we condense time when we need to because if there was a boring part in the interview where nothing interesting was said we slow things down when someone says something interesting in a good in a well-written interview when we get to an interesting part we might pause we might break up the quote with a description of the person's expression we might talk about um, someone walking into the room we might talk about other colorful details that slow down the telling for dramatic effect and that's a useful thing to bear in mind and that's another example of the tension between showing and telling and then there's another way to think about showing and telling and that's how they create movement in your story and a really good example of this is a podcast um an episode from a podcast called reply all it's actually in two parts and the story of this particular pair of episodes is it starts when one of the presenters receives a scam phone call where someone is trying to uh, tell them that, that there's been some problem and they need to pay some money well this sparks the curiosity of the presenter and he decides to try and track down the person in the call center that's making these scam calls there's a whole bunch of them making these scam calls it's very well known he finds out there's an address in india and he travels over to india to try and track down this call center and speak to the people who work in it so first of all the fact that he travels to india is him trying to show rather than tell he could tell us the story of what's happening in India, but he wants to be there and show us through audio what it's like. So we get the sound of him walking down the street. We get the sound of his conversations. But we also cut from that to him in the story, in the studio, sorry, talking to his co-presenter about the experience. And this is basically telling. Now, he could have just used the, the tape that he'd recorded in India. He could focus purely on showing what happened. But what he does is he cuts between showing and telling. He's telling his co-host about what happened and then cutting to the recording of it and then cutting back and then cutting back. And that creates movement. It creates variety. It keeps us interesting. It stops us um, getting bored. So that's another thing about showing and telling. Although the general rule is show, don't tell, actually alternating showing and telling can sometimes be more interesting than purely showing. So those are the narrative tools that you have to play with. Those are the tools, the instruments in the orchestra that you can look for when you are learning how to tell stories in a platform or a format that you've not used before or that you want to get better at. And the point of this is to create movement, to, to keep um, the audience engaged, um, but not to annoy them, to frustrate them, to violate their expectations. It's really important to emphasize that all these tools that you have as storytellers, it's very rare that there's a genre that you can use them all. So as I said, you can't use a narrator in printed news, written news. Um, you can't stretch out a story if it's um, a hard news story. It's got to be punchy. You can't use a chronological approach in certain formats and so on. 
But the most important tool of all is structure. And that, as I said, is going to be the focus of the second half of this session. So um, I, I'm going to give you a scenario here then as we move into the, the second part, which is quite a common scenario that you might find yourself in as a journalist, which is you, you're at a conference, in this case, on um, climate change. And we've got a couple of speakers. The first one talks about how they overcame censorship by collaborating across borders. Then you hear from another speaker who talks about how climate change coverage has changed um, at their organisation. Now, you've been asked to write a story about the event. The challenge you have is to organise that information. So in this section, I'm going to talk about structures and how they help you to write more quickly um, and ideally in a, in a way that engages your audience better. And I'm going to start with this narrative structure. This is called Taxi's typical narrative structure. And it's a structure that I find the most useful in thinking about stories, looking at stories, um, editing stories, because it really covers quite a lot of different genres and different formats. There are six parts to this structure. It starts with the abstract, moves into orientation, then complication, evaluation, result, and the coda, the end. Um, and uh, you can see a summary of what each of us is about, um, but I'll show you some examples, which is much easier, show, don't tell. So here's a, a nursery rhyme that I uh, used to basically sing as a, as a child and a lot of other children sing in the UK. It's Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. Now, this even this nursery rhyme has that narrative structure really quite obviously embedded in it. The, the abstract of the story is that Jack and Jill went up the hill. If you didn't hear anything else, you would still understand what the story was about if you heard that line. Then there's a bit of orientation. Why did they go up the hill? To fetch a pail of water. There's a complication next. Jack falls down. There's the evaluation. He breaks his crown, his head, and a result. Jill comes tumbling after. There doesn't seem to be a coda in this, but I'll show you some examples of codas in a moment. Here's an example of the same structure as you might see it in a documentary. So a very different genre. Nursery rhyme is a whole genre in itself. Documentary is a particular genre. Documentary might start, if this was, this was a, a nature documentary, it might start with something like, the rhino is one of the rarest animals in the world. Now that's your abstract. That's the, the key kind of issue that we're dealing with here, the threat to the rhino. Once that's established, we might move very quickly into the orientation stage where we're talking about the, 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 um, uh, the, the venue of this story. So it might go, you know, CDY National Park is situated in this particular part of this particular country. And then we hear about a problem. That's the complication. Poachers are hunting the rhinos. What happens next? Well, the police are trying to catch them. What happens next? A poacher is caught or escapes. And then towards the end, we will have what's called a coda, which is essentially looking ahead. What happens next? It's expected that rhino numbers will take years to recover. If we're looking at a nature documentary, that's often what might end it. And codas are, are actually... Um, one of the most useful parts of this narrative structure, this approach, um, and also one of the things that people forget about most. When you read a story or watch a film or a TV show or something like that, really pay attention to when it really ends, because often the ending that you remember is the result. You know, the, 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 uh, the baddie is defeated. That's the result. But actually, there's a bit after that. That's the coda. That's the actual ending. And that's um, it wraps up loose ends or it looks ahead, something like that. In a news story, if you're struggling to end a news story, the ending is generally, you know, when does the event take place or when 
does uh, the court reach a judgment or what's you know basically what's going to happen next where can i find out more information those are all examples of coda here's an example of a news story the abstract is that women only uh, carriages could combat the rise in sexual offenses on public transport according to a labor mp that is the story in a nutshell we don't need to read anything else if we don't want to then we have some orientation so this is the you know who said it um, and why um, and it carries on in that vein how about this presentation this talk i actually started with an abstract i started with the story about me getting to grips with snapchat that was the story in a nutshell that's really what we're talking about here but um you know summed up in an anecdote i had some orientation i talked about the kind of history um behind where we are now and i had the complication the problem that we are facing which is having to adapt to many platforms then i moved on to evaluation and the results and when most of the story is focused on the evaluation and the results the abstract is very brief the orientation is relatively brief a problem is introduced quite early and then most of the story is about dealing with that problem dealing with the complication so that's the evaluation and then the results at the end now obviously we're still in the middle of this story so you'll have to look out if you're eagle-eyed look out there is a coda at the end at least if we do this to time, and I'm not sure we will. So I might end up rushing and we'll get the pacing all wrong and you'll feel frustrated when it moves too quickly. But there's a lesson for you. So the inverted pyramid, the abstract is what happened. Um, we have, as I said, some orientation followed by complication. And at the end, what's going to happen next? A quote which looks forward is another way of doing that. So a, a good example of this, if someone's being injured, if that's your story, would you start with last night at 11 p.m.? This is orientation. Would you start with on Broad Street in Birmingham? You wouldn't. And yet lots of people do because they've, they've, they've learned a different genre of storytelling. Uh, they've learned to tell stories where you start by setting the scene. It was a beautiful day. Or... Um, the rain was bashing down on the house, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not how we tell a news story. We don't start with that orientation. We start with an abstract, which is a man has been injured. And actually, even in fiction, when you start with a scene, really it's an abstract. It's acting as an abstract of the conflict in the story as a whole or something like that. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. So if we were telling the story of Jack and Jill using the inverted pyramid structure, we would start with a brother and sister have been injured after falling down a hill. That would be the story, an abstract of the story in an inverted pyramid structure. And we'd, we would go on to add some orientation, the complication and so on. So when you're approaching a story, it's a good idea to make a list of those different elements. What's the story in a nutshell? If you were telling someone that story um, in a tweet or something like that, what would you tell them? You wouldn't run up, rush up to your friend and say, it was 11 o'clock at night. They'd look at you like you were mad. We don't talk to each other that way. You would rush up to them and say, someone's been injured. And then they'd say, where, when? You'd fill in the orientation and so on. So I'll make a list of those when you're approaching a story and then you know the ingredients that you're dealing with. Now, the inverted pyramid is just one of a number of structures used in journalism. Um, the martini glass is another. This is basically the inverted pyramid, but with a long stem attached. You have the hourglass, the kebab, the diamond, and you can find out more about all these structures um, at the link in these slides. I'll share it later on on Slideshow, and Ian will, will have a copy of it as well. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these structures. Um, the inverted trapezoid is one to be aware of. This is, is kind of... Um, 
trying to keep people's attention a little bit more. And again, there's a link in the slides to more on that. Um, another thing to mention is the drop intro. The drop intro is kind of a variation on the inverted pyramid that you can use occasionally for a particular uh, type of story that where it will work well. And this is where you don't actually give them the audience the story in the first line, but you, you drop it uh, lower in the story. Now, as I said, you don't see this often, um, but this is one example of it. So this is a story about the inventor of Wordle, the, the online puzzle. And the story essentially is that his family is proud of him. His family has reacted to his success. Now, that might be one reason why they've used a drop intro. It's quite a difficult story to, to kind of write as an abstract. The family of the inventor of Wordle is, it says that they're really proud of his success. Okay. Instead, what they've done is they've, they've kind of teased the story. So it starts off with, here's the toast of New York, of London, and of a small village called, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. So, okay, so we've got this little tease, right? Okay, you're going to tell us something. Who is this person? Just four months after Joss Wardle invented the wonderfully simple and soothing puzzle Wordle, here's a megastar in the world of games and a great deal wealthier after the New York Times acquired his creation. So we've got that orientation still. Um, and then we eventually get to the point of the story. So this is something you can do if, if, if you're really confident with the inverted pyramid, I would say, um, try and find examples of a drop in short and then know when it's worth using. Another structure to mention is the Wall Street Journal feature formula um, structure. And you'll see this a lot in longer feature stories, um, uh, possibly longer news features as well. And this starts with an anecdote. Um, I'll show you an example in a minute. So again, it will be easier to, to understand from that. But essentially, that anecdote serves as, a, as an example of the phenomenon that your story is going to explore. And after you've introduced that anecdote, you then go on to the big picture that it's part of. And then we go on to the problem and what's being done about it and so on. So here's an example of, uh, of this structure. It's also called the, the kebab or the kebab. Um, so it starts with, during the 13 years that Connie and Guyan has worked in Bay Area nail salons, she's seen numerous friends and co-workers become ill. She too has come down with mysterious skin rashes and respiratory problems. A few years ago, experiencing shortness of breath, she went to the doctor. So we've, we, we're, we're brought right into the heart of the story, close up, one person. What this is doing is telling us First of all, why we should care about this story. Um, we care because it affects individuals. And um, we're also making an implied promise. So we're talking about the expectations of different genres. When you introduce a story like this, you're basically promising the reader, this is going to be worth your time. I'm not giving you everything up front because this is a good enough story but I can afford to take my time with it and kind of tease you a little bit and, and drip feed you bits of information. So after that anecdote is introduced, we then pan out to the big picture and, okay, what does this person represent? What is she or he an abstract of? And so after that first anecdote, we get, amid a booming beauty industry, California's legions of nail salon workers most of them Asian immigrant women, are being exposed to hazardous chemicals in cosmetic products. Chemicals that have largely gone unregulated because state law exempts cosmetics and personal care products. So it's, uh, we've established very quickly why this person is important and what they represent. So we're getting this close up picture of a particular phenomenon. 
Now, there's some examples here. Um, this is one uh, Quinn Raber arrived at a San Francisco bus station lugging a canvas bag. So again, another example starting with an anecdote. But I want to highlight here as well, with these feature stories, there's often a stand first. So a paragraph that um, is placed between the headline and the story proper, which again, acts as an abstract. It sums up the story. So if you're writing a longer feature, it's often the case that you will have a stand first that, that sums up that story quickly in a way that helps readers understand, is this worth my time? So actually, this paragraph about Quinn Raver isn't the first piece of information they read. We understand this is what the story is about first. And in radio as well, you get, um, you get a, a, an abstract, if you like, before the package. So if you record a radio package, for example, what's worth emphasizing is that that package doesn't exist on its own. There is a, a cue that you write before the package is broadcast. So it's what the presenter says to introduce the story, to introduce the package. And um, it basically, um, as you can see, this has an orientation, it has a complication and an abstract altogether, even before that package starts. So it's, it's performing quite a useful narrative function. And often when you create a package, you will write the queue for it as well. So that, that is a really key part of the story construction. So let's move on to um, other structures as well. Freytag's pyramid is worth mentioning here. This is, if you like, an extension of that um, common narrative structure that I mentioned earlier, um, where we have the abstract and then moving on to other parts of that narrative structure. But in this case, we've got rising action, events that add suspense or tension to the plot. We have a climax and then falling action as well. This structure is, is more useful for, um, uh, for story types where you've got a much more length, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. And in fact, I'm going to talk about it in relation to uh, Phineas and Ferb. I don't know if, if, how many of you have ever seen Phineas and Ferb, the, the cartoon. Um, but uh, one, of the way, one of the things that's really interesting about this for me is that Phineas and Ferb, a bit like Tom and Jerry, probably more of you have seen Tom and Jerry, but it's uh, Tom and Jerry isn't a long cartoon. But Tom and Jerry essentially is the same story every time, a, a cat chasing a mouse and vice versa. Phineas and Ferb is, sorry, excuse the noise in the background, <laughs> um, Phineas and Ferb is a, um, a cartoon, but it lasts a, a good 25 minutes or so. And again, it's the same story every time. But what's really interesting about that is that people obviously watch that story over and over again. And actually, it's uh, played with a little bit. So we have that Freytag's pyramid structure. We have an exposition at the, at the front. I, I know what we're going to do today, which is what they say every episode. Um, there's an initial incident, a, a conflict between the, the two rivals, if you like, or enemies. Uh, there's rising action. Uh, Candice, which is the sister of Phineas and Ferb, um, has a rivalry with, with her brothers. Um, there's a, a rivalry between the, uh, the uh, platypus and the villain in the piece, and it carries on. And this is the same every episode, to the extent that the same pieces of script are repeated each time. But the reason we're watching it every time is we want to see how it varies, what, how, how they do it differently, how they do the same thing, but different. Now, um, uh, one of my uh, particularly good example of long form storytelling in The Guardian um, about a, a lawyer who deals with immigration cases is a, if you like, a more serious, more journalistic example of the same approach. It starts out by describing his um, breakfast routine, 
then it it talks about an instant where someone calls there's um rising action as we talk about other calls and then eventually there's a part of the story where uh, some appeals are being heard and then that essentially is the climax of the story before we have some falling action where the the continuing days of the case take place and a resolution in terms of the, the actual court's decision now after that resolution there's still what's described in Freytag's pyramid as a denouement it's essentially a coda and that's where we find out what happened to or what is happening to the characters that were introduced in the story now this is factual story telling these are all real cases this is a real lawyer but it's been organized in a way that keeps us engaged for thousands of words because it's it's arranged in a way that that keeps the story moving forward. Um, it's worth mentioning briefly the Fichtian curve. This is a, a kind of a variation on Freytag's pyramid, um, it, which begins a bit more quickly. And that's another uh, uh, narrative structure you can explore as well. So having introduced those structures, I'm going to move on to long form storytelling next. But the, the key point I wanted to make here was that these structures are standardized and generic. So again, it's about expectations. When we read a new story, we expect a structure that gives us that story in a nutshell in that first paragraph. If we read a story with an anecdote in the first paragraph, that's a different structure. Although it actually follows the same pattern with that, the, you know, the anecdote essentially acting as, a, as an abstract, it's a, a variation on that structure that you need to identify. So the inverted pyramid is useful for particular stories, but also other structures we might see in feature writing in particular, podcasting, video and so on. The other thing to mention about structure is variation is always useful to maintain the interest of the audience. So um, in terms of written storytelling, you're generally dealing with three ingredients, quotes, facts and background. And my advice would be if you do any of those three times in a row, so for three paragraphs in a row, you should change to one of the others. So if you've got three quotes in a row, then switch to some background next or to some facts. Likewise, if you've given us three facts, switch to some quotes. Uh, if you can't, then it's probably time to finish the story. Don't overwrite it. Now, more recently, it's worth emphasizing that those three elements that you would normally use in, in print journalism, you now have images as well and video and other embeds. So you can alternate between quotes, facts, background, and images and video in a story. And that gives you more ingredients to work with. Now, tweets are a really interesting example of um, structure in storytelling, in factual storytelling as well. And um, again, I'd say kind of one of the common mistakes that I see made when people write for social media is to approach it as if it's promotion or marketing. You should always write for social media in the same way as you write for a website or for a podcast or anything else. It's not an advert. Um, it's a platform to tell your story and you should tell it in a way that's native to that platform. Tell it, retell it in a way that works for that platform. So it should have a beginning, a middle and an end. And too often, you know, tweets are basically come and read my story instead of this is what the story is. So this is um, probably one of the uh, examples of the most crammed um, 180 characters you'll find from a journalist. Um, this is a, a chronological story. Uh, this was uh, way back when um, uh, Ukraine was last in, in international news, if you like. Um, so we have the impeachment of Yanukovych, um, Tymoshenko being freed, uh, an election being scheduled, uh, the uh, Russia not being very happy, 
And so this tells us a story, a whole bunch of things happening, complete with hashtags integrated into the story as well. These are some other techniques that you might see. Again, we've got, we've got different parts of the story. We've got a beginning and an end. So think about when you're telling your story on Twitter, do I have a part one and a part two? This happened and then that happened. I've got some movement in my story. Good example from a, this is actually not on Twitter. This is a, a, an alert, you know, of a number of people seeking support in court because they have no lawyer is up 520% since 2011. Here's how they're coping. So here's a fact. And then what happens next? Um, man, man returns to flood hit home, finds terrifying intruder inside. That's a story. We've got a begin, you know, a beginning and an end, if you like. Um, I like this, this other one from BuzzFeed as well, because it's all in one sentence, but there actually is a beginning and an end. Here's literally everything I know about Game of Thrones having never seen an episode. So there's, there's two parts to that, even though there's no punctuation between part one and part two, and there shouldn't be, it, it just works as a, as a story structure. A story about friendship, mothers, and a phone message that went viral in the early 90s and had something to do with The Little Mermaid. So we've got things happening and a little twist. He got kicked out of both Nirvana and Soundgarden, then he became a war hero. Sequence of events. What's interesting about this example, that the original tweet that the New York Times put out was they just took the headline from the article, the rock and roll casualty who became a war hero. And it didn't, didn't work very well on social. It didn't get a lot of um, retweets. It wasn't favorited a lot. This was back when favorites were on Twitter rather than likes. They rewrote it and it was much more successful. Memes, same structure as well, beginning and end. Um, if you can, you can have three parts. You can have some action, then a hook, and then a resolution. So I've done some data journalism. That's the action. Ed Miliband is wrong about Fredo's. That's the hook. And maths proves it. That's the resolution. We put a call out for embarrassing stories. That's the action. And got back more than a thousand. That's the hook. Elna Barker tells Ira Glass about some of her favorites. That's the resolution and so on. So it's, again, a sequence of things. You're moving us through the story. Um, actually, uh, cues, if, you, if you've ever written cues for radio or standfusts for those magazine features, these actually can work quite well as tweets or maybe adjusted a little bit. But this is an example of what's basically a cue. You can imagine this being read out on radio for many white Republicans in Bladen County. The origin story of how their town became the poster child for election fraud lies with seven nursing home ballots from 2010. This week, Zoe tracks those ballots down. And you can imagine it going into the package of a news report, but it actually works quite well as a tweet as well. Then we've got the call to action. Meet the man who did this watch this, tour this, read about this. And what happens when, what it might mean when. These quite generic now, again, the more you read good professional tweets, and this works for Facebook as well and other social platforms, um, there are slight differences between them, but um, these approaches tend to work for them all. And this is one resource if you want to get more ideas. This is quite a, uh, it's not about journalism, but it's about copywriting. And again, it gives you kind of structures, if you like, almost story structures for social that you can adapt for different situations. So I want to, I'm going to end, uh, I'm just going to switch my slides off there. I don't know if you want to go to questions now, uh, Ian, before I go into uh, long form storytelling. Yeah, well, I, uh, we've just got a couple of questions. Well, I think one of them probably relates more to the uh, long form 
uh, so um, from uh, so yeah um, let me just see where was Fred's uh, question uh, and again this might be uh, well yeah at which point at what point are we imposing a structure upon a story as opposed uh, to we kind of all um, or are we kind of always doing that all right okay so at what point are we imposing a structure upon a story or are we kind of all, all, always doing that anyway? I guess this is an ethical question at the core. I think I think that's I think I understand what Fred's asking there. You, you know, is you know is is there an ethical choice we're making when we choose a structure to a story? Whether we're doing that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Intentionally or 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 just instinctively. Exactly, and 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 be instinctively part is really important so um and this is the problem that i foreshadowed at the, at the beginning which i i will come on to a little bit later but um so yeah i mean i mean first of all i think we instinctively do this and not only that but our sources do as well so people tell us stories when we interview them and uh, the key thing for me to, is to be conscious of that and to be conscious of what we're doing so we already impose structures on stories. Um, and if we consciously do that, then we can be critical about that and critically do it and, and think, okay, what is the, uh, how can I impose a structure on this in a way that is, that is going to represent things most accurately? Um, that's going to, you know, you know, for example, if you've got context that you want to bring into that story, knowing about these structures helps you think about ways of doing that and I, I think what's harder is when you're you've not got those tools at your disposal and you're un unable to convey pieces of information that you think are really important to the story or put another way your reader doesn't get to that point because your story doesn't engage them to that point um yeah yeah, thank, thank you, Paul. I think that that's probably it for now. I'm going to come to Vavy's question and Story's question in a moment because I think um, that they're, they're, they're talking more about this more narrative, longer form narrative journalism. Uh, so we'll, we'll come to those in a second. Okay. Okay, so I will, uh, for this final part then, I, I want to talk about long form storytelling in particular um, and, um, and the specific challenges that they present. Um, essentially, with, with news storytelling, we have a lot of the work done for us. You know, we, we, we know we're going to start with what's new. So we kind of know what the structure is. We've got fewer words to work with. We don't have to hook the reader so much as we would otherwise. Um, so I, I want to kind of take a step back to some of those narrative concepts. And I want to talk about Mika Bell, who um, is a, a well-known narratologist and he defines a narrative by saying it has to have an actor and a narrator we've already talked about narrators and how they can be invisible the actor can be the narrator as well he identifies three levels there's text for story and the fabula which i'll come on to and he says that a, a story should contain a series of connected events that are caused or experienced by those actors so we've got this idea of events being connected now this might sound a bit basic but it helps you to kind of strip back a story and think about okay what does this mean in practical terms so that's what i'm going to do so elements um uh, the the fabula the um uh what was it the texts and the stories um essentially when you when you're telling a story it has elements what Mika Val calls the fabula so these are characters places times themes objects things like that and we we tell a story by combining those elements and leaving some of them out so we might do lots of interviews and some of those interviews aren't included we might go to certain settings and so on and in fact we can take one story and create multiple texts out of that story we might write it as a news article, we might write it as a tweet, we might create a social video for it as well. But it's the fabula that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and I always think about 
characters, setting and movement when I want to tell a story or when I'm helping a student with a story. Um, the problem that we face often as journalists is we want to tell a story about something that's important, but nothing new and dramatic is happening. A classic example would be climate change. OK, um, even at the moment, the cost of living crisis. OK, that's a crisis. But what's happening? OK, people are struggling to pay their bills, but that's not going to be the headline on a story. Person struggles to pay bills. Um, so this is where I think character setting and movement are really useful to think about. Um, I'll give you an example. If you map the characters in an issue, you can look for where there is movement between those characters. Conflict is the obvious example, but chemistry is another. So chemistry is where people are drawn together in some way, not necessarily romantically, but it might be that they have a shared cause or something like that. And then there are settings. Where does the story take place? At a very basic level, you can make a story more interesting by cutting from one setting to the next. That creates geographical movement, um, if nothing else. So if we did this for the environment, OK, let's say I want to tell stories about the environment, then I can I can list the characters involved. OK, we have protesters. That's the most obvious dramatic uh, character involved. But we also have regulators, much more boring but actually potentially more important. We have chief executives, we have people who inspect stuff, we have politicians and so on. Likewise, with settings, we can start with the more spectacular ones, but also things happen in the boardroom, which are really important. There's you know, factories that are involved in this. There, there might be something that happens in a bedroom. You know, Settings can lead us to new ideas and new stories. And this is where we become, we can, move away from cliche and move away from stuff that's obvious and then of course the movements so or the conflict the chemistry um people who are driven in a particular direction people who are driven apart people who move from one place to another athlete a is a really interesting example of this this is a documentary uh, on netflix if you get a chance to watch it there's also an accompanying website. This is about the um, abuse of uh, gymnasts in the US gymnastic team. And um, it's a really good example of telling a factual story in a very engaging way by thinking about um, quite complex issues and events. Where do we start? Where do we end? Uh, and it starts with an athlete who um, was due to compete in the Olympics or, or you know, was kind of in, in line to compete and was um, left out for reasons that, that you then kind of start to explore. So it raises that question, that hook in the audience's mind, why? Um, and that question takes us through a really important, really compelling documentary about a really important issue. And you can think about different characters involved in this that will lead you to different interviews. You can think about different settings that, that help move people through the story. You can think about movement. There's some really interesting stuff about ambition in there and, and the role that ambition plays in, in, the whole, um, in the whole story, for example. That's an example of movement. Uh, people reporting offences, that's an example of movement. Obviously, people being arrested, prosecuted. These are all things that are going to play an important role in a story. Um, I'm not going to play you the, the video, but um, this is them talking about a particular scene. And again, useful to, to get an insight into those storytelling techniques. We chose. One of the uh, best pieces of advice I ever saw about the connection between events, this idea of connected events, was to look at your story, look at the ingredients of your story, and think about connect those connections as either the word therefore or the word but. Um, and if that isn't there, then you've got a problem and maybe you should rethink the two events that you're putting together.
So, uh, and I think from a journalistic perspective, what's really interesting here is it helps you identify things like systemic problems. So if you get a, a, a therefore is often a unintended side effect, for example, a lot of um, investigations are about unintended consequences. New legislation is introduced or new policies are introduced. They don't really work as they intended. And then but is when something doesn't happen as expected, which also is interesting and important journalistically. So an obvious example would be a crime was committed, therefore police investigated. That's going to move the story forward and help us focus our uh, reporting. So we know we need to speak to the police because the crime was committed. OK, we would expect that to happen. But if we find that it didn't, then equally that's important for our story. Um, it might even be the story. And ultimately, with all this structure, you must have a point of the story. Um, there must be a reason why we're telling this story. Uh, Ira Glass in this clip, I'm, I'm wondering if I've got time to play it. Um, uh, go on then. <laughs> I mean, one, one of the things I think is really important if you're making stories for television or radio is that you understand the building blocks of the stories. And, and there are different ways to think about this. One of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to think about it the way that you learned in, in high school, which is in high school, we're all taught that the way that you write is that there's like a topic sentence and then there's like the facts which fill out the argument. In broadcasting, it's completely different. In broadcasting, I think you have two basic building blocks and they're very powerful and you can use them as you will. And one is the anecdote. And an anecdote is literally just a sequence of actions. If you think of it as just like, like, what is a story in its purest form? A story in its purest form is somebody saying, this happened, and that led to this next thing, and that led to this next thing, and that led to this next thing, like one thing following another. And some of the things in the sequence can be, and that made me think of this, and then I said this. Like, there could be thoughts and ideas as part of it, but like one is leading to the next, leading to the next. And the power of the anecdote is, is so great that no matter how, in a way, like no matter how boring the material is, if it's in a story form where, where there's an anecdote happening, and then he said this to me, and then I went here, and then I came downstairs, and I thought, like, what the hell? Like, it has a momentum in and of itself that no matter how boring the facts are, like, I'm trying to think, like, the, like okay, there's, you know, if you try to think, like, the most boring possible story, okay, there's a guy, and, uh, and he wakes up, and, um, and he's lying in bed, and the house is very, very quiet just unearthly quiet and so he sits up and he puts his feet on the floor and he walks to the door of his bedroom and again just very very quiet walks down the stairs looks around just unusually quiet now like this is the most like what i'm telling you is the most boring possible fact pattern and yet there's suspense in it it feels like something's going to happen and the reason why is because literally it's a sequence of events like this guy is doing this thing, he's moving from space to space. You can feel through its form that when you have one thing leading to the next, leading to the next, you can feel inherently that you're on a train that has a destination and that he's going to find something. And so one of the most powerful things you have to figure out is like, do you just start with the action or do you know, should you just start with the action? And generally you, you want to start with the action or you often do. Um, so, so, that, so that's one of your building blocks. Um, the other thing that that little anecdote has is that it's raising a question from the beginning. And that's the other thing that you want is you want bait. You want to constantly be raising questions. And so in that little story, the bait is that the house is very quiet. And so the question hanging in the air is why? And it's implied that any question you raise, you're going to answer. And so again, that's another thing you want to manipulate. You want to be constantly raising questions and answering them it's from the beginning of the story. And that the whole um, shape of a story is that um, is that you're throwing out questions to keep people watching or listening and then answering them along the way. Okay, so 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 you have the building block, which is like the actual sequence of actions, the anecdote part of it. The this thing happened and then this thing and then this thing. That's one building block. Then the other big building block, your other tool, is that you have a moment of reflection. And by that I mean at some point somebody's got to say. Here's why the hell you're listening to this story. Like, here's the point of the story. Here's the bigger something that we're driving at. Here's why I'm wasting your time with all this. 
And one of the things that's very, very unfortunate for people who are launching into the kinds of jobs that, that all the people who are making um, video pods uh, are launching into, one of the things that's so very sad, and it's like the bane of my existence, and it's the bane of anybody's existence who does this kind of work, is that often, you know, you have the two parts of this, the, the two parts of the structure. You've got the anecdote, and you've got the moment of reflection. And often, you'll have an anecdote which just kills. It's just so interesting. Like, this thing happens, and it leads to the next, and it leads to the next, and it's so surprising, and so many things happen. You meet these great characters, and it means absolutely nothing. So having a point is, is, the, is the other part of this um, recipe, if you like. You know, you, there, there must be a point to this. You must, there must be a reason for you taking these people along on this journey. Um, why does this matter? So I, I mentioned earlier about starting a story with an anecdote, which tells us why should we care? That, that gives us the human impact of something. But at some point, we need to know why this matters. Um, is this person representative of 100,000 others like them? Um, why does this matter? Uh, and in data journalism, for example, often we're dealing with large numbers. We're dealing with the scale of a problem. It helps us identify that there is a problem. But we are always looking, if, it, if we're a good data journalist, we're looking for a case study that can bring that you know, to life as, as a human, and often that, that starts the story, particularly on broadcast. So um, we've not got much time to, to rattle through the, the other techniques for, for long form storytelling. But one thing uh, I've written about in the past is Christopher Booker's book, um, The Seven Basic Plots, uh, really interested me a while back in terms of techniques for dealing with um, investigations. It's a, it's a book about fiction writing. But I was I was reading this book and thinking, OK, how, how could you uh, adapt these ideas to uh, these typical plots from fiction to investigations? And um, I found it really useful in terms of thinking about structures for, for kind of organizing information. So stories about campaigners and whistleblowers um, are quest stories. You know, Lord of the Rings is a quest story, if you if you like. Um, it's you know there's, there's a particular mission that they're following and the quest structure is off is also a really really useful fallback option so i've got the presenter led if your investigation doesn't necessarily get the result that you were hoping for in terms of the massive kind of reveal or you know you expose something for, for what it really is then at the very least you will have a story about your quest for truth and this is where it becomes presenter led you become the vehicle for the story and if that quest has still unearthed important information you know the fact that you can't get answers the fact this information is not available might actually be really important that might be the story and if you're struggling it, I guess one thing, this one reason why I think this is really useful, knowing about these structures, is for, for a lot of people, they might think, oh, I didn't get the big reveal. I didn't expose the injustice that I thought I would. I, I wasn't able to get the information. They, I, they kept slamming doors in my faces. They used every strategy to, to, to stop me. I've not got a story. You have got a story if you know where to look, if you know how to tell it. And the story is of official obstruction. The story is lack of transparency. And it's your journey and your frustration, the quest, that is the vehicle for that information to get to an audience. Um, if anyone's listening to the Trojan Horse podcast, that's a really good example of that. Uh, and And... The more you're aware of these structures, the more you can detect it in, in other stories as well. You can kind of anticipate what's going to happen because of the structure that they've used. Um, essentially, that is a quest for truth. And the fact that they use the quest uh, structure probably suggests that they might not get what they're setting out to find. Um, overcoming the monster is, is, is a, a story type that you can use when something is threatened or someone is trying to stop something. Um, rags to riches, I think, is a fascinating one because I think rags to riches is the most common story that interviewees tell about themselves. Everyone thinks that they have 
overcome adversity and risen from rags to riches. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, lots of us have. Um, but it's worth being skeptical, um, even if those people believe it themselves. You know, there's, you'll see classic kind of memes about American multi-billionaires and how they rose from having a mere, you know, five million pounds that their parents gave them to having five billion pounds or whatever. Um, it's all relative. But these story types are quite useful in being sceptical about what other people tell you. So when someone tells you a rags to riches story, you might think, oh, what a wonderful story. I'll tell that. Whereas actually, maybe there's more to it. Maybe um, there's something more interesting here. Tragedy is a useful structure about how things went bad. Uh, when something bad happened, so when um, uh, Carillion failed, you would see stories, investigations into how did this happen? That's essentially a tragedy. We don't often get comedies in investigations. Um, you don't often get voyage and return stories either. Um, rebirth stories can be quite an interesting trigger for ideas. You can look for people who've, who've had, um, if you like, a, a, a negative existence and, and turned the other way, so a criminal who's turned into um, someone who helps former criminals um, reform, et cetera, et cetera. And you can read more at that link as well. So some of these examples that I'm going to flick through now, um, this is essentially a tragedy. You know, how did thousands of claimants um, end up in, in a situation where they get their benefits stopped? Why are they suing? Um, the, the tragedy of Blackpool, or indeed this could be a rebirth of Blackpool. What's happening? We'll find out. Either way, we know we've got a story. And this can also help you. I'll go back a slide to the, um, let's go back. Uh, this is quite a good example of how these structures can be used in practice. If I wanted to set out to find out what was happening to, to kind of the, the towns that were left behind, I've got a couple of possibilities here. I'll find what I think I'm going to find, which is a tragedy, or I'll find that actually some of these towns are kind of reinventing themselves. Well, that's a rebirth. So I've kind of got things covered either way. Whatever I find, I know I can tell a story about it. So if I pitch that to my editor, I've got a plan B. And maybe plan C is my quest to find out what happened to these towns. Um, S-Town is well worth listening to on, on this front. We've, you've got a really interesting start where he's, he talks about an antique clock. Um, loads of fantastic narrative techniques in s -Town. So I'm just going to end with beginnings. Um, and then I'm going to skip through a few slides so, so we're ending on time. Um, uh, I, I talked about anecdotes. You can start with a person, but also you'll see some stories that start with a place or some action or a particular detail or a question or a problem or a revelation. Um, these are all useful ways to, to start stories for different ways, uh, different reasons. So people often struggle with beginnings and endings. Um, and, um, and hopefully this will give you some uh, different options in terms of starting longer stories. Some examples of our settings. Uh, this is a really good one about poisoned water. And it starts with a, a particular scene with water rushing out of a fire hydrant. Um, because that setting is important to the story. This was a, re a really good one. You know, the hotel door was the dividing line between essentially rich and poor. So that's what they start as, as this kind of metaphor for the, the division that their story was about. Um, starting with a person, uh, people who sell the big issue. This was a story I worked on, on player trafficking, uh, Nigerian uh, young footballers. And again, starting with these, these two boys playing football. Uh, sorry, two boys about to, to board a boat. Uh, this is a really interesting example that stood out to me from a Manchester Evening News story about a food bank. A tiny pair of shoes, along with nappies for a newborn, sit on shelves in the storeroom of the Manchester Central Food Bank. This is essentially an abstract. 
you know, that, that detail captures something that sums up the whole story. So I'm going to skip through the rest. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about this, unfortunately. I just want to end with the problem. So the, the problem, which was hinted at earlier, is this um, discomfort that I have about narrative storytelling, the idea of us being storytellers. We're journalists, um, self-important high priests of facts. You know, we're not storytellers. We're not, you know, we're not dealing fiction. And um, so I think there's a certain amount of egoism that, that we need to acknowledge and kind of address. And, and as I said earlier, um, humans are storytellers it's really interesting if you look at cognitive bias it's all about our, our natural tendency to see patterns even where they don't exist and stories are patterns where sometimes they don't exist conspiracy theories are stories that people see in unrelated events so if you like we're, we're in a world where storytelling has gone mad and we need to be conscious of that we can't pretend we are not storytellers we can't pretend a, a bar chart is not a story or a pie chart is completely neutral um, those are stories as well they're editorial choices we choose the ingredients that we use we choose the order that we put them in and if we don't do that critically then we're just lying to ourselves so i had an argument with alberto cairo this was um the, the kind of result of it um uh, it wasn't really an argument. We agreed with each other in the end, happy ever after. Um, so what um, what I wanted to end on was that, that importance of questioning yourself. Are you just picking the easiest story to tell unconsciously? Could you look at the options available to you, having a much bigger and richer toolkit and make a better choice? You have to make a choice because that's the nature of journalism. It's the nature of storytelling. We can't just publish a transcription of an interview, for example, people aren't going to read it. So make that choice, make the best choice you can. Um, think about uh, those genres and, and how they influence what you do. If someone tells you a rags to riches story, do you just think that's a great story or do you think that's a genre? Um, that's a cliche. Maybe I could tell something a bit more original. Um, am I treating someone as an archetype, as, as, as a cliche themselves? Um, is there something richer and more interesting that I'm not seeing here because I'm not thinking about it? So I'm going to skip all of this. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's lots of research about the, the importance of stories and how effective they are in, in increasing recall as well. Um, but I'm just going to sum up with, as I said, these concepts help break down the problem and they help you identify challenges that you weren't even aware of. When you're dealing with an issue and you want to turn it into a story, think about characters, setting and the movement between them as a way of um, focusing your reporting and uh, organizing the story. And then anticipate the problems that you might face and address those, um, not just in your own storytelling, but also those of your sources. So that takes me bang on to six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, Paul. Uh, have you got, Five minutes just to, to rattle through some questions. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Let's okay, do it well, quickly. Yeah. Let's do it quickly. So, um, so a story. I don't know. Story is that your real name, or is it story? Because we're talking about stories. I don't know. Anyway, story. Um, and Asha kind of have a similar question, talking about really the the role of the writer in particularly long form narrative, what we call narrative journalism. Asha saying, um, I see it more and more where, you know, the journalist, you know, the, the, the journalist is writing so-and-so told me or told the Atlantic. Mm. And I was just saying that kind of sticks out like a bit of a sore thumb. Um, do you have any thoughts about it becoming more common? And likewise, stories asking, sorry, stories actually your daughter's name. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you touch a bit on uh, the role of the writer, na narrator in, in, um, and when it's appropriate yeah that, yeah so I, I guess um the, the the 
the first thing is it's probably not a, a straight news story. It's probably a, a more of a feature story or a news feature. Um, it, essentially, what happens is the journalist becomes a character in the story as well. And that's where the, the narrator is also an actor in the story. Um, and um, it's uh, the, the first thing is to be conscious that that is happening and to uh, I, uh, think about why it needs to happen. Um, in interviews, for example, the interaction with the interviewer can be quite illuminating in terms of the uh, in terms of the behaviour of the interviewee and things like that. So quite often in interviews, you have to talk about your experience, you know, of the of the whole situation because it it provides extra information. Um, there is also an element to which uh, an aspect to which you are telling the story of the publication as well and you're creating a sort of an, an, a feeling of exclusivity or a feeling of access um uh, there can be an element of that you're building a relationship with the reader again as a character in the story so um i, I think if you like that there are no bad and you know no good or bad things here there are only uh, tools and whether they're used effectively um I, I sometimes have students who've had experiences that, that kind of form part of a story. And it, the, the key thing to always remember is, you know, you are a vehicle for the story. So even if, if it's happened to you, whatever the story is about, it's happened to you, you, you have to remember you're still serving an audience and, and you have to choose the details that are going to be relevant to that audience uh, and important to that audience rather than to you. So that can be quite difficult if you if you're involved in the story yourself. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's um, it, it's uh, it's some, it's also becoming more common as well. You know, all of all of these genres are, are, are really developing a lot because they're being affected by each other. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, just a couple of quick ones. Baby says um, is is asking really any differences in terms of the kind of narrative journalism we see in the British media compared to what we're, because we, I guess longer form journalism tends to, um, well, I don't know, has it, has it got a longer history in the United States? I don't know, but. Um, it's know, def I yeah, it's definitely got a stronger history. You've got the whole, um, I'm trying to think, Hunter Thompson, um, yeah, yeah, yeah gonzo, gonzo journalism type yeah. stuff and new journalism. Um, and there's there's more talked about there's more history of talking about that in the US, um, uh, but then in a weird way, the US also has more of a history of very kind of serious uh, taking themselves more seriously as non storytellers, almost as a there's quite a battle going on. Whereas in, in the in the UK, I think journalists are much more comfortable with the idea of being of entertaining readers, for example. Um, uh, of not necessarily being purely information deliverers. So, um, so yes, there's different histories for, and different histories in different countries. Again, I think what's been really interesting over the last decade is how much crossover and cross-pollination and influence there has been in that respect. So I've seen UK journalism become much more like American journalism and vice versa. And likewise, other countries' journalism be influenced by other countries. So, um, so, so people are borrowing narrative techniques and and um, conventions that are, are evolving right across border, across different countries, across different platforms. You see TV being done in ways that's more like YouTube and and so on. Yeah. Great. And then Fred, as a well, I'm not sure if it's a question or maybe just a, a an assertion at the end. Fred saying, "Would you say that storytelling is simply a way to frame information, and that in actual fact we are always framing information um, anyway?" Exactly that, and and a, and a frame is a good metaphor actually, because you know a frame excludes as well as includes. You know, we we, we choose where to point that frame. And um, and that's one of the most basic editorial choices that we make, and we, we're making that choice over and over again as as we frame each point in the sequence, each shot in a story. So, um, as I said, it, you know, it's easy to fall into routine. The reason that genres exist is it 
allows us to do things efficiently as an organization. It allows audiences to, to understand efficiently, but that can lead to laziness and kind of habits, doing things out of habit uh, without thinking about other ways, other tools that we can use. So yeah, 